now for global business updates. Rotus Uduri joins us. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Ayo, and Ro all our viewers. Rotus, this uh, is your pocket square. Um, are you getting married to Rotus? <laughs> this is your pocket yeah. square. Oh, look at who is Rufai. Hey, there's, uh, there's don't a, worry. There's an update coming. Pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> you know, should go and bring children and uh, wives and. Uh, Give us more advice. Sorry, sorry. Dr. Abati, thank you. Sorry, Rotus, move thank on like you. you never heard anything. Move of all like people to be asking me about marriage. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Move on like you never heard anything. <laughs> sorry. It was a slip of tongue. <laughs> this is my mouth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. I, actually, um, Rufa and Ayo, we've, we, we, have, we have some questions for, for the both of you to answer. Even Mr. Efeni, the three of you are collecting this morning. The only person not collecting is <laughs> Dr. Abati, who avoided assaulting capitalism yesterday. So we'll get to that in a moment. But let's start with uh, the <laughs> let's, let's, let's start with the ECB. Let's start with the European Central Bank. They held rates. Uh, it was expected. Uh, yeah, I think even Dr. Abati predicted this yesterday. So. Um, that they kept rates in place, but Christine Lagarde uh, said essentially that, well, there could be a rate cut in the future if the data, you know, suggests. So, we, we, you know, we went through all the inflation numbers yesterday. Germany at 2.3 or 2.4, uh, France at 2.3, Italy at 1.3. Inflation in Europe is decelerating. So we could see a cut uh, in June. Uh, by the way, Eva, I just saw UK GDP just came on the wires a few minutes ago. 0.1% growth in the UK in February. The UK is just trudging uh, along. So let's get to let's get to Nigeria, shall we? Let, let's let's start with the aviation. Okay. By the way, so I and Rufa is aviation. Uh, Mr. Ifeni is the industrial sector cement. So so let's 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 start with um, let's start with aviation, shall we? And this uh, matter of support uh, for the aviation sector. Um, you know, as far as support is concerned, you know, I didn't get enough time because I really wanted to ask uh, Rufa and I. They were both, you know, singing the same tune. Uh, does anyone recognize that sound? Uh, you know, they're both singing the same tune. And here is, this is on the matter of air peace and government support. So here's, here's Rufa first. Most of these other foreign airlines have the money, they have the cash. It's not what they only make from Nigeria. They have the injection at which they can fight. Your airpiece without a government support will just be left in the dark. Let's go to uh, Ayo. Now, I think Ayo should be up next. The government should offer some kind of leverage or support, especially because of the nature of this Nigerian business. Now, the, I don't know, for some reason, the refi refi's clip didn't play the entire way, but he did say the exact same thing. So let's hear from the horse's mouth. We're going to go back in time to 2021, March the 30th of 2021. Here is Mr. Alan Onyema, the CEO of Air Peace, on the Global Business Report. I'm glad you mentioned uh, enabling environment and, and the minister. Last time you were on the show, I believe you talked about, uh, I think it was with, with uh, Boston and Moffat, you were talking about the, uh, the bailouts. Um, I think it was to the tune of about 4 billion naira to the injured. Are, are you, is there more down the line or are the airlines now sufficient enough to where they can, you know, operate, uh, you know, going forward since the year is still challenging? You see, the truth is that no amount of money uh, given to you at this period will be enough. Mm. And uh, nobody has uh, bottomless, uh, you know, uh, resources. resources. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the thing is, Yes, a lot of people said the money was too small. Yes, it's too small because one spare part, one of your engines could gulp the entire four billion. Mm. Uh, one engine could is even more than four billion. But four billion was given to all of us to share. Mm. The government was only trying to help us, maybe, to see how that could help us, even if it means paying one or two salaries or you know that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not totally enough. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves to America, what America did and what uh, the other countries did. We, they don't have the same capacity. That is the truth. Mm. Uh, the country is going through a phase and everybody, every hand should be on deck. All right. So um, in the spirit of Friday, uh, with respect to government supports that Rufai and I are talking about, Justin Bieber has a question uh, for, for the both of you. What do you mean? Hey, hey, oh, what do you 
So please, if you could, now you answer the question later, I'll, you, both of you will give a chance to tell us exactly what you mean by support. So let's leave aviation now. Let's go to the industrial sector. We bring up uh, Mr. Ifeni. Let, let, me, let me set the, set the tone here. Yesterday, uh, we were wishing Aliko Dangote a happy birthday. Uh, this was, of course, on the front page of yesterday's This Day newspaper, Nigeria newspaper of record. Mr. Ifeni was wishing him a happy birthday, and then somehow we went from happy birthday, Aliko Dangote, to, hey, Dangote, you should, Mr. Dangote, you should reduce cement prices. Rufai, to your credit, correctly said that cement prices are coming down from about 13,000 to eight or 9,000, to which Mr. Ifeni dismissed and said, how is that coming down? Here, here's the clip, here's the clip. Has been congratulated by the president also, saluting him for his efforts in uh, his faith in the Nigerian economy, investing here when he could have taken his money elsewhere. And he has been a shining light and example to many others who own billions to put their money here in Nigeria, creating jobs, creating wealth for others. Of course, uh, creating uh, a lot of opportunities although we are still waiting for the price of cement to come down, Alaji, because so that is... come down from 13K to about 8K or 9K? 8K is come down. Yeah. No, to so about 8K from 13K. Yeah. So it's just for you to come down 8K more. is not come down, please. Thank mm. you. <laughs> 8K per bag of cement. You don't want people to build their houses anymore. So Alaji, that's so a challenge. Too. So, I mean... Uh, 13, come down to 8 and somehow, okay, but here's the thing. Let's go back in time, right? Let's go back to February the 6th of 2024, Mr. Ifeni reviewing a Guardian headline. Take a look, take a look. The Guardian newspaper, building material, labor spike construction cost by 200%. Of course, uh, yes, cement has gone as high as 7,000 per bag. Yet, this is a country where we are supposed to be self-sufficient in cement production now. So we want to ask the producers of cement, what is the problem? The Dangotes, the Boas, the Lafarge of this world must also ensure that we have not just self-sufficiency in cement production, but it should be affordable. Okay, so nice, good question there to the producers of cement. Dangote, Boa, Lafarge, what is the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is because on Arise News, we talk to the executives, we talk to the CEOs, we get the information from the horse's mouth. Here is the chief financial officer, Dr. Gwenga Fapunda, of Dangote Cement, where I asked him about cost of, cost of doing business. And this was in... The August of 2023, we we're looking at the second quarter figures of Dangote's financials. Take a look at what he said in terms of answering Mr. Ifeni's question. Your cost of goods sold, though, uh, did see a jump of about 30%, to $219 billion. And whenever we talk to businesses in Nigeria, there is always this conversation around the cost of doing business. So take us to what, what was the results of, you know, particularly for the, for the jump in there? Okay, um, basically, um, the, it's a couple of factors as well. And I'll walk us through about three or four key factors that drove it. Um, the first one is I spoke about the volume growth. And yeah. um, the way it works is the more you produce, the more power you consume. Uh -huh. And power is a key part of our business. So it, that's one factor that affected the increase in uh, cost of production. The second factor that affected it as well is our cost of coal. So cost of coal actually increased as well significantly. I'll give you an example. And this is across all our major markets. I'll give you an example like Nigeria. At uh, this time last year, maybe early, early of last year, we were buying uh, coal, local coal, at about 13, 14,000 naira per ton. Uh, as at now, I'm buying at about 28,000 naira oh, per ton. Oh my goodness, so, that's uh, a 100% yeah, increase. Yeah, so you see a lot of hikes, hikes in this. Uh, gas is another form of power that actually is very key to our business. So basically, um, I buy gas, I, I am building dollars by paying naira. Wow. So now, before now, ah. dollar was 465. Right. Now, dollar is now 756. So I'm now paying more Naira for the dollar. Right. So that's another impact we have. 
So, you know, uh, and Rufai, you were doing a lot of mathematics with the Minister of Works yesterday. Coal, I just checked, uh, it's about 34,000 now per ton. That's local coal, not imported. Coal at 14,000 Naira when we spoke with the CFO, going to 28,000 was a 100% increase. From 28,000 to 34,000 is a 21% increase. From 14,000 to 34,000 is a 142% increase. And that's just coal. He also talked about gas and talking about being billed in dollars and paying in Naira. He also talked about the fact that the exchange rates, 475 to 750. Where is the exchange rates uh, today? Let me give you one more clip. We, talk, we broke down Dangote Cement's 2023 financials on this show. And remember when I almost fell over this balcony, screaming blood of Zeus. Dangote, we have the numbers there. Fuel uh, and power cost Dangote Cement almost 400 billion Naira in one year. If you add what Boa Cement paid and what Lafarge, you're heading, you're heading, you're heading towards a trillion in one year uh, on power. So um, with these few uh, clips from the Arise News archives, I hope I've been able to convince and not confuse you that uh, it's not easy doing business. And so when prices reflect that, we should see them for what they are. Easier for me to be able to make my point that it's not easy doing business, and that's why government should support business a la the airpiece issue. So you ask, what do I mean by support? Number one, the first support should be that any government functionary that is flying for overseas trip on a route that airpiece goes must fly airpiece. So take for instance, if you check the line item of the budget and they say for travels, XYZ billion, if a certain amount comes, at least you are ensured of a steady revenue stream that they can use to pay small things like salary and the likes. Secondly, government trying as much as possible to also fix the problems in the refineries and all of that so we can have some level of stability in the aviation fuel market. That's some form of support. And they did that during the time of MFL. If you remember, when aviation fell went haywire, I think there was a subvention uh, Mr. Mephil and CBN then did give them to be able to stabilize prices. That's when prices went haywire. Another form of support should be looking, using the Competition Bureau to look into anti-competition practices. Let's have, you know, a level of fair pricing to be able to protect, you know, this business interest. Another form of support is to be able to look at labor relations. So you remember there was a time NLC had a big kafufu in Oweri and the airports were shut down and airports did lose revenue. So in things like that, having a symbiotic relationship also pays. Another form of support is capital injection into this airline. Government can try as much as possible to identify these airlines. I mean, government took over ARIC. The question is, how are they running it? But they need that money. So if you also invest in these businesses, or give some sum of loans that they get to pay back in the end. You can also use to make some money. And I'll give you further um, insights on that. In America, there's something called the military industrial complex that you know about, Rotus. Companies like Lockheed Martins, most of their revenue comes from government requests. It's deliberate. It's not that government cannot find alternative cheaper arrangements in the Soviet Union or Israel. Most of those defense shields, iron systems, and things like that, you can get a cheaper cost for BAE systems and the likes. But deliberately, they went with Lockheed to be able to improve production as regards that, which also feeds into you know, the American economy. Airlines like Boeing and the likes, and across board in the American sector. I mean, you talk about Tesla a lot. You remember the loan that Elon Musk got from government when he hit rock bottom? And in fact, Mitt Romney was making a joke about him in the 2012 debate that, oh, Obama is crazy. He gave Tesla cylindrical money and all of that. But those companies Mitt Romney were laughing at over 10 years ago are the companies shaping the fortunes of America today. So that's how government really can support and help. And because when government does it, it helps the economy in the end. And that's the need for government to do. Have you ever wondered why... Governments of America, UK, and all of that, we're paying four loans for workers that were at home during COVID. 
Because they know that if that industrialization and the economy cycle still continued, when things reflated, those people were going to pay taxes to government. Maybe probably you should also ask how much EPIs pays to government in taxes. You'll know that these people are part of this. All right. I mean, I think Rufai has, thank you for making, you just answered. So I'll just add a few more things to that because my position was going to um, break down what I meant yesterday by government support during uh, our story on um, air peace. And by the way, it's not just about air peace. Let me make that clarification. It's about Nigerian-owned businesses. And to be fair, there are some Nigerian-owned businesses that currently enjoy government support, not by government giving them money or pouring money, but in the way that they are able to leverage government contracts. I'll use the Elon Musk story, because that was what I was going to use as an example, because that's currently happening. In fact, it is said often that Elon Musk's SpaceX's is almost like a government contractor, because a huge chunk of their contracts come from the US government. And again, it is very deliberate in order to support an indigenous business. The same with Tesla. And that loan that Rufai was talking about was a $435 million loan in 2010, which was April able to pay back in 2013. So how do, government, um, how do governments support businesses across the world and in Nigeria? Number one, we've talked about enabling an enabling business environment. We talked about tax rebates. We talked about patronizing Nigerian businesses. As it's often said, oh, buy the Naira to grow the Naira. Government has a huge um, part to play. There was a bill that was sponsored recently, I don't know if it's, if it's passed yet, about government functionaries using Nigerian airplanes, whether it's airplanes, whether it's those that tra travel to destinations when Nigerian flights um, fly, and prioritize them. Because at the end of the day, like Rufa, you mentioned, when Nigerian businesses succeed, when they grow, it benefits the government in the long run. So government has to support businesses in that way. Okay, look, let's cut through the chase. This is a very simple topic. Government has a responsibility to support business as it has a responsibility to support citizens under Section 14, uh, sub 2B of the Constitution, welfare. When you talk about welfare of the people, it costs across the entire uh, spectrum. And it's not uh, rocket science. When Jeanette Yellen spent five days in uh, China, she was talking about overcapacity of China. The whole of that uh, argument about China's overcapacity is that China provides subsidies for businesses in China, for China to be able to overcompete within the global space. That's uh, government supporting business and creating geopolitical issues. In the United States, they have the Inflation Reduction Act. They have the bipartisan so-called uh, infrastructure bill, which the Biden administration uh, introduced. Now, those two laws were essentially meant to support American businesses. And that's why America is getting ahead in terms of competition in the arena of semiconductors. So the same America that complains about overcapacity and China, Chinese subsidy is also providing subsidy in its own environment. In other words, I'm saying that there are lessons that Nigeria can learn from China, uh, from the United States, about how you support businesses for strategic interest, not for personal interest, which was uh, a phrase that came up uh, in the last week about uh, what the uh, Tinubu administration is doing, you know, uh, complaining. So if it is for strategic interest, for you to have a competitive advantage within the uh, province of international trade, then of course we cannot complain in that regard. We complain when we see that Nigerian policymakers have no ideas about law of international trade. They do not understand uh, what it is all about to support businesses for strategic advantages. As for the uh, European uh, Central Bank, well, I think the European Central Bank is taking more or less the same position as uh, the Federal Reserve in the United States, a cautious approach. But what we take from the ECB holding rates is that they may well increase rates in June. But they are relying on data, which is something that maybe Nigerian uh, monetary policy makers will have to learn. The emphasis on data. Uh, uh, the ECB uh, uh, president yesterday was talking about wage growth linking wage growth to economic growth within the Eurozone 
and saying, okay, for now, we hold the rates. Inflation in the Eurozone is 2.4%. In 2021, it was 9.6%. Now, they've come down from 9.6% to 2.4%. But at the same time, they're saying, we will hold the rates and see what happens next meeting in June. So it's a cautious approach driven by data. And I keep asking the question, what drives you know, monetary policy decisions in Nigeria. We don't have data here. Nobody has given us any concrete data. You know, so it just looks like we run this, our own economy, on the basis of a, a thumb of the rule, or rule of the thumb, you know, as it is uh, otherwise called. So, so maybe we learn lessons in that regard. So we talk about inflation, but can we talk about inflation as the professionals do, as the experts do? rather than, uh, you know, on emotional uh, responses to the management of the uh, economy uh, by the Lagos boys, who were told, you know, run the economy in Lagos, uh, who are now learning that uh, uh, Nigeria not be Lagos. Thank you, Rotus. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rotus, for a very vibrant and necessary conversation this morning.